S one. You open it up as three separate pieces. I'm like, <laughs> come on, man. I just want a nice small desk one. Not a six foot lamp. <laughs> you have to just leave some of the. No, you have to put it together. Oh. Yeah. Otherwise, it won't, won't work. Mm. Yeah. So. Your feet sweating well. in those boots? Oh, God, no. No? No. Damn. Yeah. I'm just too lazy. I have another pair of shoes here. I'm just too lazy. Yeah. You, are you wearing socks? <laughs> ben, ben socks. <laughs> it is. It is supposed to be 15 below tomorrow. You know? Yeah. Ready. He's ready for it. Not ready to ski in that. No. Or not gonna be 15 below, but it's gonna be cold. It's gonna be cold tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's gonna be. Isn't cold. that tonight? Is it negative? Yeah. Something like that. And we really haven't had like super cold this winter. It's been clear. Yeah. But it has not gotten like brutal, you know, for extended periods of time. Yeah. Good. Yep, we're good. Mm-hmm. Cool. I'm good. Cool. We good, Ken? Yep. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again for our second Taiwan on Tuesday this season. We've got a fun lineup today. We've got Dave here with Wyoming Whiskey. John is tying up, uh, what's the name of the book? Uh, it's called a Dave's Bad Hair Day. Dave's, ba- Dave's Bad Ooh, Hair Day. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this. Yeah, like this. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> How fitting. Yeah. Um, and then Jared here is from the Snake River Fund, so he's got a lot of fun updates to tell us. Um, we have fly tying classes going on all winter, so we just yeah. finished our women's one, which was a lot of fun. And then we have a beginner to intermediate one and an advanced one starting next week and then another advanced one in March. And then Scott Sanchez is doing his own uh, personal one in March as well. So those are all on Facebook if you guys are interested. And if they need info, they can just call Scott. Yeah, give us a call. Um, we can sign you up. We can save a spot even if you're kind of on the fence. No big deal right. there. We'll provide all the materials and tools if you don't have them. Um, <clears throat> I've got, we've got a lot of other stuff going on, but we'll kind of talk about it throughout the show. Um, yeah. Dave, you want to tell us our delicious cocktail we're drinking tonight? The Gold Rush. Very simple cocktail. Uh, it could actually be served warm or hot uh, in the winter, and it's going to be cold as hell tonight, so you could do that. And it's a pretty simple cocktail. You can look up the exact measurements on online, but it is Wyoming Whiskey Small Batch, some lemon juice, and honey. Uh, it's pretty simple, but it's absolutely delicious. It's very uh, refreshing. Yep, yeah, Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I, I could drink a few of those. <laughs> might, not, just may. Might, <laughs> might not feel great by the morning time, but uh, that's it's tasty. Thank you. Well, well, John, I'll let you kick it off, and then we can go from there. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, yeah, it's just uh, a pretty basic, I don't want to say basic, but a very easy pattern to tie. It's a streamer. Um, three materials you really need. Uh, craft for the uh, first one I'm going to do is in white. Um, I'm going to tie another one, kind of a little quicker pace uh, after this, um, laser dub or something similar, and then, you know, you can add extra stuff. This is kind of, it's called a voodoo fiber, uh, synthetic, it's just barred, um, but usually I just tie it with flash or flash boon. You can do as many colors as you want, you can make it one color, uh, which is always a good option as well, um, and with there being a lot of different colors, uh, craft fur makes it uh, something that you can just tie a bunch of and they don't take a whole lot of time either. Um, I like to tie them uh, on a size, I'd say a four for trout. Um, if you want to tie them bigger for other stuff, my friend that uh, came up with this pattern usually uh, fishes it for smallmouth primarily. Um, but either way, it, it catches uh, anything that eats other fish essentially. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to blabber too much. I know these guys have some stuff they probably like to talk about in regards to the river, wine and whiskey, other events, all that kind of stuff we got coming up here. But, uh, I got yeah. a question for you, John. Okay. So if Howard ties flies at 25 miles an hour, let's just use that as a standard. Okay. Would you say you tie at a faster or a slower pace than Howard? It depends on what we're talking about here <laughs> because I've definitely tied some flies where it takes me an hour and a half to tie one of them. It and, also and I don't know. Yeah, I would have already had to do that like three times just to get that first wrap on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I spend definitely more time than most people probably do at a vice, but, uh, but you so know. So you're a perfectionist like Howard? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if something's not tied right, I don't like the look of it, I'll undo it. <laughs> but Is that a learned trait or is that genetic? <laughs> I would hard, say. Like I, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. I'd say probably a little bit of both. But 
Um, so, I mean, f to tie this fly, uh, again, it's primarily made of craft for um, when tying this pattern as well. It's it's best to tie with less, um, the kind of less is more mentality with it. Um, I mean, you can see the little bit of batch or the little bit of material I have here. It's really not a whole lot. Um, considering what I'm going to do, and you'll notice if you've tied with craft for, for excuse me, or not, um, it is a synthetic hair comes on a pelt if you'll call it that and it actually does have a guard hair underneath or uh, under fur um, so uh, at least for the back step here um, I'm going to take it out and I'll explain why and then eventually I'll leave it in and again I'll explain why but I'll take a lot of that uh, hair from underneath and I'll take that off um, not something we need uh, we're not trying to build any bulk in this pattern just yet eventually as you move forward you'll want to, to add some bulk to it but um, not at this stage so again it, when you take that uh, under fur out you can see there's quite a bit um, just helps with uh, again just the bulk and I'm going to kind of cut the ends or the butt ends here a little more squared I like fishing like these smaller streamers yeah um, and I there was a point in my life where everything I threw was gigantic and massive and, totally um, I've kind of and I'm not a good fisherman. Let's just be honest about this. Like, <laughs> let's be clear. I, I can I like the water, but I'm not always good at this stuff. Um, but I I like that it's small. You know, right totally. Back. Yeah. No. I mean, I'm I'm the same way. I, I've uh, had plenty of friends, and sometimes I do it myself, where I'll still fish really really big stuff. Um, but if I'm going somewhere where I've never never fished before, or actually, um, again, just personal fishing i don't really like fishing big stuff either um especially articulated stuff kind of gets clunky in my opinion um i like a little bit sparser tied stuff smaller uh i have a lot more confidence in that when i'm fishing so uh, anything that you got confidence in you're probably going to fish it better than something you don't yeah so um so yeah just grab some some flash boot here not a whole lot this is called lateral scale or just if you had a pearl um would work as well uh we're going to kind of squeeze that under here on the back side of the tail but not tying it in yet because I'm going to add a little bit of this voodoo fiber to add some barring to it since it's just white uh, craft fur and there's not much going on there so um, again less is more with a lot of this stuff too I don't like throwing a ton of it on if it just hints at a little bit of barring or anything like that um, that works for me so at the store here if you guys have any supply chain issues um you know with fly tying stuff Yes, I mean that's. I don't think that. Do you think that's really had anything to do with COVID on a broader spectrum? I mean, I think that's just kind of in general with more people getting into fly fishing. There's always been like some materials that are really popular that are, were just kind of hard to come by at times, but you know. know. I mean, stuff that's been coming from offshore. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. Issues that way, did you know with? Uh, yeah. Lots of other departments have been. They have, yeah, that regard. The store for sure. Yeah. 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 Besides fly, fly tying materials, um, we haven't had too much of an issue. It's kind of like we can't get this, but most of this we can. Uh, but definitely with, you know, hard goods. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rods, uh, uh, waders, wading shoes. Sure. Yeah. Was there an uptick in... Um, during like the the peak of the pandemic um, and lockdown of people tying at home, um, do you think like that? I'm sure there too? was. I mean, I feel like we couldn't really tell we were closed for yeah. two months. Yeah, yeah but that's true. With fishing, fly fishing in general, absolutely. That first yeah. summer. Oh yeah, it was. no doubt that there's more people yeah. out there. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, like you know. there's no doubt there's more people enjoying rivers and, and yeah, wild I'm places. Sure. That's so. a that's a good leeway, um, Derek. Why don't you kind of tell us yeah. a little bit about? yourself and your position that you're in now sure uh, well i'm the uh, well th first of all thanks for having us thanks for tasty cocktails appreciate it cheers um uh i um I am the executive director of the snake river fund and um we're a small organization here in jackson and um we're actually you know into our early 20s in terms of years um being around in the valley and the organization was initially um, started as a, a result of a desire to potentially charge fees to access the Snake River, um, particularly <laughs> on the, the National Forest down in the Snake River Canyon. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was kind of a groundswell of support to say, hey, we can raise the monies needed to 
um, manage the river <coughs> corridor and provide services. Mm -hmm. You know, that was well over 20 years ago. And, and since then, we've matured um, to to still support the Bridger Teton National Forest and things like that and boat ramps and, and public right. access projects. But we also um, provide educational programs for kids and adults and clinics, um, whether it be, you know, providing swift water rescue education yeah. or clinics <laughs> for guides and things like that. So, um, you know, at the, the heart of what we do is we promote public access uh, largely to the river um, and to its headwater tributaries. Um, but we also, you know, believe in public access just as a, as a whole to public lands. And, and, and so we, we do advocate for those kind of things. Um, and then we uh, work in strong partnerships with lots of other organizations to support river uh, yeah. stewardship. And, um, and that's everything from trout habitat restoration projects to, um, you know, small scale um, forward facing things like um, trying to right now today we submitted a grant request to, to build a, a western wyoming water dashboard a mobile app to so people can look at stream flows and temperatures and oh, cool things like that turbidity yeah. um, so like trying to give people more resources so that land managers and the public yeah. can be engaged you know so lots of different things so jared don't you find now pretty much across the board with just about most of Things that you're doing, or whatever, um, that being on board with other entities, Trout Unlimited, and that type, that's, that's just kind of the way things are now. Uh, uh, absolutely. Like the kind of the secret sauce to getting things done, and, and I think it's something that the Snake River Fund is, is proud of, is that yeah. partnerships are absolutely the key. Um, we can advocate till we're blue in the face and go and do things alone, but it doesn't have the reach without working, you know, across organizations. And in, in reality, we don't, we have limited budgets and limited bandwidth. And so when you work in partnership, you can use the resources and assets of your colleagues, whether it's, you know, Snake River Fund, working with Trout Unlimited, working with other nonprofits, educational organizations, things like that, you can really expand your reach. And so it, it's absolutely the way the Snake River Fund gets things done. I always felt that, you know, back in the day uh, with our outfitting business and whatever, and just what you stated there, uh, <clears throat> kind of how the Snake River Fund uh, kind of got started was, you know, the Forest Service wanted to charge um, for river access of launching boats and boat launches and things like that. And that's how you guys started. And I've always felt like you guys were really part of that kind of glue that started bringing these other entities together, going like, hey, you know, you just don't have to fight that on your own. Um, let's, let's get this and this and this and this and what the other people are good at. Yeah. And put that all together. There's no doubt. Like, there's power in numbers. And so, like, you know, just today working on this grant application to submit it, that grant application, while I submitted, you know, the application and it's leveraging funds from the Snake River Fund, from Jacksonville Trout Unlimited to public dollars and others. And, and, you know, to build out these visions on this stuff, it requires, you know, collaboration. <laughs> and, um, and really, when it, it comes to leveraging money, that's the key. Um, and so that's been a, um, a huge element of the Snicker Fund. And we've had, um, the last couple of years, tremendous years. Um, and it's great. We have great support from our outfitting um, community, and that's been historic. Um, but the private individuals have really um, come forward. And I think people are recognizing the, the river is a busy place, um, but it's also a really important place for people. And so... Um, it's trying to balance, okay, like, yes, boat ramps and access sites are busy, but once you're out on the water, it's good for the soul. It's good for, like, for so much of what we, um, you know, come here, live here for, and, and how we, you know, find our, our peace. So um, it's good stuff. I appreciate everything you guys do. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. You know, I, I get to, to think about water even when it's, you know, falling from the sky as snow. And, uh, <laughs> right. Or it's and, frozen on the... <laughs> yeah, or it's frozen, you know, walking along the levee today. It was like, oh, God, yeah. But yeah. Most of that's not really accessible right now, but yeah. uh, but it's flowing under there. Yeah. All righty. Um, one, one part I'd like to talk about uh, on the fly here is the next step in, in tying in some of this craft for 
uh, how I was saying before that we don't really want to use any of the under fur on the tail. Now what we're going to do is we are going to start utilizing some of that under fur. And what that's going to do is now we're going to create some bulk underneath. Um, what that's going to do for us is it's going to push a little bit of water, get this craft fur moving, which is, is going to look nice um, and fishy for us. And uh, it's just kind of a key element to this fly where if you decide to remove a lot of this, it looks like it's going to be a pencil swimming. Um, it doesn't really have much movement to it. So um, key here in tying this, though, is we're actually going to reverse tie it. So we're tying all the materials going towards the eye of the hook. And I left uh, that under fur under there, uh, just kind of squared off that with my scissors here. I'm going to put it John, over. Did you, uh, did you double your that lateral? Yeah, yeah. So when I tied uh, that, that voodoo fiber or the barred flashaboo or flash stuff uh, and the uh, lateral scale, yeah, I just doubled it over or pulled it backwards, yeah, yeah, like tied over. It yeah, exactly. Uh, so that way it also it locks it in there. It's not going to get pulled out. Um, and if you want to, like I did, I actually put a little super glue on there too. <laughs> it makes it a little more durable. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to reverse tie this next clump of craft fur here. Um, kind of doing some loose wraps to collect it all. And then we're kind of going to take some tighter wraps. And again, you can kind of see we have that under fur stuck in there. Uh, sometimes I'll pull this stuff out because you just got some fibers in here. You really don't need. Now, is that enveloping the whole hook? Yes, yeah, it's enveloping the entire hook. It's going to be tied in the round, if you will. It's all the way around. Um, next thing I'll do is I kind of grab it, and I just open it up. You know, you have different tools that you can utilize for this, too. Um, this is like a little brush or the miniature dog brush. Right there. I was say, it if looks we, like Jared's hair. Yeah, this yeah. Hair. Honestly, you can pull a little lock out and you, tie it in there. It's good luck. Add a little extra color in there. Um what I'm going to do is I just got like a little dubbing uh, material tool here, or teaser, excuse me. And I'm just going to make sure that that encompasses all the way around the hook because I have tied them before where I thought it was uh, enveloping the entire hook, but it wasn't. Um, and so just kind of making sure I don't have any little pieces in there that I don't want or anything along those lines. Obviously, right now it looks kind of uh, unruly, but what we're going to do is I'm just going to take it, I'm going to preen it backwards. It's just kind of a matter of being very hands-on with these flies. Um, I will say be careful of your hook point when doing this because I've definitely stabbed myself quite a few times in my fingers doing this. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to take my thread and I'm going to pull it forward and start wrapping in front of this craft fur. We're not trying to tie over it. We don't want to smash this down. We want that to kind of have a halo effect around it because when you're fishing it, it'll collapse a little bit anyways. Um, but again, if you, if you decide to tie over the top of it, it just doesn't do a good job. Uh, from here, what you can do is you can keep adding craft fur if you want, which we will ultimately do. But um, I'm going to come in with just a different color uh, flash. Again, I want like a pearl and that barred stuff. I'm just going with a silver holographic, kind of sticking to a white and silver profile. You know, we have a lot of, a lot of white fish out here, and so I, I think white tends to do really good if you're targeting uh, a lot of your a lot of your bigger more predatory trout uh, so that's why this is kind of a more more favorite uh, color scheme of mine just all white and all white just fish is good anyway so i'm a fan of holographic fish <laughs> yeah <laughs> I like very that. natural holographic yeah. fish so this fly is intimidating a white it imitating Correct. And, and again, and you can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Either there, they're going to There's gonna definitely going to be some sculpins and whitefish darting away from this thing. <laughs> totally. Um, when we're tying this flash in, we're not trying to envelop it 360. I'm still kind of keeping it on top, but I will spread it around at least so it covers the top half of the fly. Um, again, it's going to orient this way when you're fishing it anyway, so you don't want it all the way around. Um, at least I don't tie them that way. And I haven't noticed that doing it one way over the other is super super effective or anything like that so um justin mccarthy is watching from grand rapids michigan okay. thanks justin for tuning in he wants to know if we have any sims pro nippers he can't find them anywhere i don't think so they, well, they, they wouldn't be on the wall would they no they're over here 
Uh, <laughs> one? Apparently we have one. What color? Orange. Orange. Wow. Ooh. You won't lose one. Is it? No. Primarily waiters, but we got one set of orange Sims Pro nippers or guide nippers on there. Um, Dave, did I see that Wine Whiskey is a sponsor in the Rendezvous Fest? This yes, year? indeed. Uh, after two year absence, uh, we actually got in on this a couple years ago, and you know the pandemic hit and everything came to a, a halt. So uh, after two years, we've maintained a good relationship with the Mountain Resort. And we're back. Uh, we're one of the lower level sponsors, but you will be able to get Wyoming whiskey at the events here on the square and out at the village. So we're really excited to be a part of that. Uh, they're good partners. And Roadhouse as well is going to be sponsoring. So um, we'll be working with them closely. Big, and you'll be able to get all local. Big name um, bands. If you're from out of town, it'd be a good weekend to come in. Yeah. I thought it was going to be in March, but now March is so busy, uh, they have to push it out to April 1 and 2. I noticed that. I, it was a little later. I was surprised by that when I like, yeah. saw that today. I, was, I did not expect it to go that far into the, the spring side of things. I know. It's good. <laughs> yep. Yep, but great names. I, I remember seeing Ben Harper at the Moose early on in his career, and I'm like, oh, I got to see that guy when he was nothing. Now yeah. I get to full circle it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it'll be fun. I was just playing like Ben Harper tune was playing on the way in here tonight on the radio. Of and I was course, like, what? you know, like, already yeah, he's right, like <laughs> all over it. it. It was not like it was not Fish's, uh, you know, what was his uh, thing like the the show, yeah. his daily cast or whatever. Oh um, yeah, his catch, catch of the, of the day. Catch of the day. <clears throat> yeah. Alrighty. All right, now what do we have going on? Uh, so we're just reverse tying more craft for in. Usually you do three reverse clumps and then the tail. Um, obviously the more craft for you add just gets bulkier and it kind of doesn't want to move as well um, and it kind of gets a little heavy to tie I mean this being a synthetic does shed water pretty well when you're uh, when you're fishing it take a, a good back cast a lot of that water will shed off um, it's a great substitute for a material like marabou too if you like to tie uh, I usually usually use quite a bit of craft fur during the winter time even on some stuff um, you know, if you're walking from spot to spot, if your fly will freeze, uh, other materials, uh, natural materials like marabou get pretty brittle, um, and will break. This stuff moves really, really well. Uh, the one, one downside, I guess you could say to craft fur, uh, it does tend to tangle up on itself a lot or get kind of knotted up. Um, so I know my buddy, uh, will do it where he actually carries a little brush with him and he'll just brush the fly out as he's fishing it. Um, you know. Yeah, they fish really well for them, so I can't knock it, you know, kind of deal. But uh, it, they do tend to kind of twist and other things like that. But, again, craft fur moves really well. It's a lot more durable. I don't mind if this stuff freezes during the winter time because I can bend it and all this other stuff, and it's not going to break. Yeah, it's not going to break on you, so. So you will fish, like, a big, heavy fly like this in the winter, even, like... So it's it's funny that you say a big, heavy fly, because... It's not heavy. Exactly. I'll hand it to you at the end here, and this really is not a heavy fly based off of... Yeah, you didn't add any... It's just fly. craft for the hook and a lot of synthetics in regards to dubbing in, in that laser dub. Yeah. It really doesn't weigh a whole lot. So this fly in particular, I like to fish if I'm uh, using a sink tip line, okay. um, which I'm kind of going back to trying to fish smaller stuff um i'm definitely also leaning more on the side of trying to utilize a line mm -hmm. to get my fly down than tying a streamer that weighs sure. a thousand pounds yeah. and a heavy line yeah. so it's just kind of experimenting here and there with different uh different weight systems you know different lines all that stuff if you want to you can definitely add some lead wraps to this or the non-lead wire um to get it down but i don't i don't really find it necessary um um, you may to have do. just mentioned this, but <clears throat> do you downsize these streamers for fishing locally or the size you're tying now? Um, so, I mean, the size I'm tying now I really don't think is, is a big fly. Um, again, it's a size 4 hook. I don't know, lengthwise a 3.5-inch fly maybe. I don't know, maybe more like 4, 4.5. Four but, um, I mean, if you see, like, if you're fishing a full-size sex dungeon, they're really big flies. Even some of the other stuff people tie that are, like, triple articulated are really, really large and... You know, uh, I wouldn't say those don't have a place in the, in a fly box, but I will have a lot more confidence fishing some like this um, than stuff that's pretty pretty big. So, 
but and so by changing up the color patterns you'll just basically change up the bait fish like that you're mimicking exactly yeah and so the next one i'm going to do it's going to be a combination of like tan uh like a sand kind of color and then olive okay so yeah you can kind of make it make it whatever you want um i've tied some that i kind of tried to make look like a small brown trout same thing with rainbow trout um all those other fun things you know if you think about uh all the guys that like to fish gear, I always kind of look back at, okay, what, maybe if they're throwing crankbaits, what color crankbaits are working well, and try and tie stuff similar in sure. color anyways. Uh, so it's just kind of, it's something that's nice and fun to, uh, and easy to tie, and you can tie it in a whole ton of different colors. I mean. This is your basic Rapala, but for the fly world. Trying, <laughs> trying anyways. <laughs> what about beads? Do you ever add beads? Uh, I mean, yeah, you definitely could. Again, kind of going back to weighting it, you can add a bead, you can add uh, the lead-free wraps on there. Um, cone, yeah, cone, yeah. lead eyes, all that kind of stuff. You know, lead eyes would give it a jigging action. The same thing with, um, same thing with throwing a bead on there, especially if you throw it up right at the eye of the hook. This I like doing unweighted because there's a lot more of a neutral buoyancy where it doesn't uh, doesn't really drop. I like it because it kind of will jerk to the side and sit. Um, I think that being able to keep it kind of in that zone of a fish is a little bit more important than kind of trying to fish stuff fast. Usually I think your bigger fish, if you can make them mad rather than them trying to eat it out of a predatory response because they're hungry, uh, I think that's a little bit more of something I kind of believe in than just trying to throw it in there because they want to eat it. So you're doing this most of the time with a tip? Yeah, with well, a sink tip line. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So then you're kind of emulating a little bit that I talked about last year with steelheading, where I don't weight my flies. Or anything. Yeah, you're going to uh, utilize that tip to get tying relatively a very sparse pattern. Yeah. And relying on the tip to get the yep. fly down to the to the area that I want it. To exactly. Be. Yep. Yeah. And then still feel like I'm getting the movement. Yeah. Where I feel like if I have a lead eye or a cone, I have a stagnant fly. Yeah. It's doing this. Yeah. Where this is doing. Yeah, it's undulating going right. forward, and then it drops, and absolutely. So, um, yeah, I got a lot more so confidence in that. Undulate. Hey, I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See all hand, Howard's hand motions and gestures here. So I got a question for you, Jared. Yes. We were talking a little bit earlier about challenges you had during COVID and stocking the shelves. Whatever. Have you? Did you see anything in particular that was a, a, a challenge for your organization? Well, as I said, we ha we've had good um and during the pandemic the years have been good in terms of fundraising and support um from the public but i would say the challenges that we are facing is it has a lot to do with just new users um a lot of different types of users on the river systems people kind of exploring new places and so i, I would just say that the use of um, our rivers has just really grown and, um, and so I don't know if that's a, a challenge or a problem, but trying to educate people about good stewardship and good yeah. ethics and um, how do you and, do and, that? And because edit. well, man, the frustrations <laughs> we've all felt over the last couple of years has been profound. Yeah, absolutely. And and we all you know share etiquette with people in other elements of our lives, like you know whether it's you know, playing golf or you know, at the ski hill and, and stuff and there's always going to be somebody out there that's going to push your buttons or you're just going to shake your head and that same thing happens at the river um but you have to you have to speak up when people are being um unsafe i think i think that that is something that we need to build a culture of is that when people are unskilled and unsafe it it benefits us all to educate them um yeah. when people are just being um irresponsible and kind of um not thinking about others that's that's a harder you know right. harder thing to reach out to um mm -hmm. but you know just think about the snake here like the main stem of the snake um from let's say south park to astoria that's a busy section of river mm -hmm. it's the town reach it's it's got every type of use from you know guided fishing trips to the 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 guy heading out you know, with the family after work um, for a quick lap and, and fishing to paddle boarders to tubers to, you know, people learning to kayak and ducky. So you have all of these different uses in a very confined space. And then we all know 
you know, skilled people on the oars and paddles, it makes a difference. And when you don't have those skills, you got to build them somewhere, right? Like we we all move from green circles to blue squares and and black diamonds. Same thing on the rivers, but it does. Uh, it's a challenge, and I would say we've seen a lot of frustration. We've gotten a lot of calls over the last two years of like, how do we educate people? And that is, um, that's a hard thing. We, you know, we definitely use social media to try to do that. Um, we, you know, recently the last couple of years we've been putting out um, life jackets at a few of the the key yep. boat ramps, just trying to give people the tools to say like, hey, okay, you didn't bring your own, here's one, take it with you, uh, put it on, even better. Um, and give them the tools but boy it's it's a challenge and we lost an educator uh this last few days in a john gardner who was never afraid to let somebody know what's up yeah (laughs) and and it it really is important you know to to speak up and have those people in the community so like when we when we lose like you know long-term river rats um it's a hit here locally and and you know what, when we're river rats, this, the fact is, is we do travel. We go to other waters, right. and it's okay to speak up, you know, like sometimes outside of your home waters to say like, hey, there, there could be a better way. Um, and I will say, you know, we, we pride ourselves on trying to help out with, uh, you know, providing good public access. We do have some challenging boat ramps in this town and, and in this, on this river system. And uh, with the, the incredible fluctuations of our, our waterways here, sometimes we do really do have black diamond kind of boat ramps and those zones in particular are really contentious when we get out on the water we spread out and mm-hmm. that stuff kind of mellows out but when people are backing in trailers loading different types of craft boats are coming in from upstream without you know um, views into and eddy and stuff that can be really challenging it can be it can be scary it can be dangerous but it leads to some some hot heads out there Maybe you could do some uh, backing up, like maybe some racing at the uh, Summit of the Snake so, this year. Uh, yeah. Speaking, of, yeah, speaking of, like when we do, uh, we're doing, we're the Snake River Fund and the Jackson Hole Kayak Club and, and many other partners are going to be um, bringing back a, an old element of Summit on the Snake, and we're going to have uh, a Snake River Festival this spring. And maybe we should have, you know, as part of the Guide Olympics. Trailer, trailer backing up, yeah. you know. Like <laughs> uh, Howard, you want to lend your car to that? Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm not participating. <laughs> I'm not judging that either, but uh, man, that would be a that'd be a, it'd be like, fun. It's like the new demo derby. Yes. I mean, you know, I'm gonna bring this. I'm gonna bring this before the, the, the four lanes. Yeah. Four lanes, all side by side. You got to keep it straight, or or else. Uh, I like it. I like. Yeah, I think yeah. the I think the <clears throat> Teton County Fair has a new event. But <laughs> yeah. Um, Catherine Bradford said, "I work in the Snake River area of Wyoming, areas of Wyoming, and she agrees with all your frustrations. <laughs> so you're not alone." Uh, and then we have another question: What's the biggest threat to the Snake River right now, in your opinion? Oh wow, that that's there's a question. there's a lot of challenges out there. I would say. A real something we really saw this year that I think is really important to think about. Um, our tributaries to the Snake River were at record lows this past year, and they were warm. They were low flows. Um, we saw some temperatures consistently, you know, up there. Um, but the Snake, the main stem of the Snake, is a dam-controlled river. Even though it, we they often refer to it as a freestone, and, and, a, and it's a wild and scenic river. There's still the influence of Jackson Lake Dam mm-hmm. and managing water in a changing climate. Like, look, it, it snowed 10 inches in the last like 30 days here. That's that's pretty scary. And, yeah. I, and I just looked today, like the snow water equivalent is somewhere like it's right around 95 percent right now mm-hmm. of average um, for. So for a, really a lack of snow for 30 days, yeah. um, we're pretty good. Yeah. But I think those uh, water resource issues are going to be really important for us to pay attention. And it's going to take a lot of effort to understand that, you know, water is here for fish and habitat and wildlife. But it also, this water goes downstream to supply irrigation yeah. water and drinking water. So it's a challenging um, management topic. Um, yeah. But I, I would say that that is going to be something for us to really um communicate about and, and think about and, and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to create this water dashboard is um so that people can see in real time you know the, the information is out there at like us stream gate usgs yeah. stream gauges but it's not easily digestible 
by the agency folks and the public to have a good dialogue on how do we manage water. So I think that's that'll be a, a big one. And then also increased use um, will have its own problems. Um, um, okay. it, it's not to say that like one group or user type is better than the other, but you know, sheer numbers of people out in the water is at the point it's, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't go. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily go fly it. fishing on July Fourth <laughs> no. um, from South Park to Astoria. Um, no. That might not be the. the, you the, the get on the river. Yeah, the <laughs> reach of water. Yeah. Um, you might want to choose a, a smaller backcountry stream at that point. Yeah, yeah if you can. Uh, yeah, but. All right, John. What do we miss uh, you doing there? Uh, so the last thing I, I'm doing here is I'm just putting some Senio's laser dub uh, around the head, again encompassing the whole hook here. Or tying in the rounds so um, for the length of the material uh, I just tied it kind of at the halfway point um, just to build up a little bit more bulk in the head to get that tail or the back part of the craft for here to really move uh, while I'm fishing so uh, again I have it tied backwards all I'm going to do is again just kind of making sure it encompasses the whole hook here making sure Dave's hair is real, real at least mm -hmm. somewhat somewhat kept up here not so rowdy using a brush and not a yeah, for, for it looks, this. It looks like an old gun brush. Is it specifically for, like, the hair and dubbing and stuff? Or uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's designed for titan flies. It's okay. called a dubbing brush. Um, just, Yeah, just kind of like a plastic or a hard plastic bristle. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, now I'll just preen the materials backwards again, kind of just brushing it out to break stuff apart so it doesn't get trapped. Um, just kind of moving my thread around so I don't hopefully break my thread. It kind of looks a little unruly, but that's all right. Once you get it fishing, you'll see why it doesn't doesn't matter that it looks all unruly at this point. So all we're going to do at this point now is I'm just going to whip finish. Kind of, again, holding everything backwards so I'm not trapping anything. I'm going to do another set of whip finishes. I always like to do... At least two sets of three whip finishes. Maybe I'll do a little bit more sometimes. Uh, I think that holds a little bit better than a head cement. Um, I don't think I've had a fly come apart in a very long time since I've started doing it this way. Uh, compared to when I used to just do a very quick whip finish and then put head cement on there. So, But that's the finished fly. I mean, again, I don't think it's a very, very complex tie. Um, it's a very just kind of uh, generic looking big fish profile where it's got a bigger head. And obviously it tapers down to the tail. A lot of that flash is going to move nicely for you. Um, you can tie them articulated if you want to. I, I've My friend Dave has done it. Uh, usually he'll do it that way for like largemouth bass back in Wisconsin where they don't have an issue eating bigger flies or pike. But, I mean, something like that. I have no problem fishing for trout out here. Yeah. Um, again, small white fish. The next one could add different colors of flash like pinks and stuff in there for... Maybe a rainbow trout, which maybe I'll do, um, but it's just kind of a very general. You're right. It is light. It's you know, yeah. There's, there's like nothing to it. Yeah, it's it's definitely like dangerous. You want to sit hard? No, no, it's fine. Um, no, so for the folks that were thinking possibly this is a pretty big fly. Oh yeah. Uh, compared to yeah, this this guy. And, with and all the weight and all the bulk. yeah. I mean, it's it's a little bit bigger this guy, but it's also got lead eyes in there. A head that's going to absorb quite a bit of water. Same with the marabou, rubber legs in there, stuff like that. Where, that um, yeah, yeah, something along those lines. But um, yeah, this is going to be ten times lighter to cast, um, which is which is key for me. If you're going to be fishing uh, at least streamers all day, uh, the lighter. I was just going to say <laughs> the, the I think the lighter the fly, the little bit better. Yeah, your arm's not going to get quite as tired at the end of the day. So to me, it looks like Einstein's hair. That's a beaut. I, instead of Dave's hair. Yeah. Well, oh, no. Dave's got hair like the hair. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so. <laughs> Man. The other thing to keep in mind there, too, for when you're streamer fishing, you know, uh, a fish, especially a trout, will eat the entity the third the size of his body. Yeah. So, you know, 16 inch fish will eat that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah, they won't have any issue with, with doing that. All right. Let me grab Are there 16 different... inch fish out there, Howard? <laughs> much everything we see when people come in everything's 19 inches 19 right. inches just just right. under 20 it was almost touching yeah. it yeah um, 18 i don't know where 18 went but everything's 19 now 
I'll tell you though, I've gone out with um, Wyoming Game and Fish a couple of times to do some electro fishing, and I am amazed at some of the fish that come up. And now, granted, totally. it's electricity that's helping. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I, I've seen some fish in the snake where I like I've never seen a fish like that on my fly. <laughs> it's, not, it's not possible that thing yeah. lives in there. I've cast in that hole hundreds of times. Right. Like, where where have you been? So. Do you have any glue eyes on that fly? I don't. I, I guess you could if you really wanted to. Um, I don't think it's a necessity. Um, but if it also makes you fish it with more confidence, uh, I'd say go for it. So. So back to the measurement thing. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I think to keep well. Let me start off by saying I think the difference between a good and a great fish is twenty inches. Mm -hmm. If you catch twenty inch fish, you've done something right. And it's really easy for an angler to say. You know, oh, it was definitely a 20, right? When it was probably like a 17 and a half or something, right? So I kept telling myself, I need to be able to know on the fly quickly whether or not I've got a 20-inch fish. And so the uh -oh. only tattoo that I've ever gotten uh -oh. Uh -oh. in my life uh -oh. are those two dots, <clears throat> which are exactly 20 inches from, from the, the tip of my finger. Oh, my God. So I can tell you quickly whether or not I've stuck a 20-inch or not. Ha and ha has it ever... Worked? Have you, I've have used you it a hundred times, <laughs> and I would say ninety of those times it wasn't twenty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. That's funny. I like it. That's a good, that's a good mark right there. Yeah. Like, yeah. No one would ever know it's a tattoo either. Yeah. That's yeah. the goal. Um, so we kind of talked about Snake River Fun's been around for t almost twenty-five years. Yeah, we're he we're heading towards twenty-five now. High Country is how we're having our fiftieth anniversary this year, twenty twenty-two. Um, and then Yellowstone's having the 150th anniversary, right, Dave? And y'all did a That's special little whiskey, right? Yeah, we started out last year with um, our first national parks endeavor where we donated a significant amount of money to the National Park Foundation. And that was for the benefit of all parks uh, across the country. And our, our kind of saying is like wide open spaces. That's the Wyoming whiskey theme right now and what we're targeting and outdoorsmen and one of my goals this year is to target more Trout Unlimited, you know, uh, Mule Deer Foundation, and, and really get into the, those worlds and donate money there and, and hopefully expose them to some, some whiskey that's not Canadian. Um, but this year is a follow-up to last year where we are sponsoring specifically Yellowstone Forever and their support of Yellowstone National Park, which turns 150 this year. So we're donating 150000 bucks. Uh, to them, and we're going to be earmarking that for some specific purposes in the park. Uh, so it'll be steered in that direction, but we'll be offering a, um, a very limited edition uh, that'll be available starting on the 150th anniversary, right when the park opens, basically. And it'll be available in the park um, through Delaware North, you know, and all of their, um, all of their stores. It'll be available in the Wyoming Liquor Division and around the country in, in different a few different markets, um, but we're really excited about it. Last year's was a huge success. People love the whiskey itself. What they love. Uh, it was just general. Um, we we featured the Tetons. This um, Tuck Fonelroy was our photographer, and we wanted to do it from the air. So we took photos from the air. I think he took about six or seven different flights in October from a few years ago when it was particularly snowy. Yeah. So you got those contrasts of these beautiful dark blue lakes hmm. with white around it. And uh, we did four, uh, we actually ended up auctioning off four bottles um, in a, on a much larger scale. Uh, Harrison Ford had selected the four images. He signed the cards for it. Uh, he was very generous with his time and whatnot. It was kind of cool getting to know him. But uh, we auctioned those four bottles off. And then we had a fifth bottle that was available for the, the masses, so to speak. And that was of the Tetons taken from like up over Moran, you know, looking south. So it was a very cool shot. Well, Ken's got some good pictures of Yellowstone if you need it. <laughs> we might hit you up. Yeah. Ken Takata Photography, everyone look it up. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Don't ask him yeah. about it. Yeah. We're, it. It's awesome to be able to support the parks that like that are the, the reason why so many of us choose to live here or have been fortunate to be here. Um, it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's helped form who I am as a person, you know. And, yeah. I could think of one of the proudest fish I ever caught in my life was in the Yellowstone. Um, I was a pretty young angler. I'd only been out here a year or two, and I was with a buddy of mine, and I ended up trying every fly in the book to try to catch this rising trout, and finally it was I found a nymph, this just furry little tiny nymph 
that I floated and it worked. And I, it, it was 19, actually. We measured it. Uh, but it was pre-tattoo the most. Pre-tattoo or post-tattoo? <laughs> pre, pre. Um, but, I, you know, you had those things on your rod that yeah. you glue to the. And uh, it was one of the most beautiful cutthroat I've ever seen in my life. It's dark, you know, just beautiful. And uh, so I think about that and all the experience I've had in Yellowstone and in Tetons and whatnot. So it's important to me personally, but I think it really fits with the brand DNA of Wyoming whiskey. Yeah. You know, the whole wide open spaces thing. Yeah. If you think about the Mead family and their history here, and um, interestingly, I don't know if you guys know this, but Senator Hansen, who was Brad's grandfather, two-term U.S. Senator and Governor of Wyoming, he initially fought the formation of Grand Teton National Park. I mean, he was on the cover of Time Magazine, I think, might have even been holding a rifle across his chest saying, you know, over my dead body type of thing. And he later came out and, and uh, admitted he was wrong. Yeah, what, a, like, what a, an amazing point like to, to make is that he, you know, reflected later on in life um, to say, wow, the, the vision here was tremendous. And I made a mistake by, you know, opposing it. And now look at, like, right. the benefit. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's unbelievable. I, I've um, had many great fishing experiences in both Grand Teton and Yellowstone, but like I'll, I'll never forget like taking my mom to fish like up on the Lamar, confluence of Lamar and Soda Butte Creek, and walking out, and kind of moving between bison and herds, and going down the river, and being like, all right, like there's some cool pocket water here, some big old glacial yeah. erratics. Like you just got to make like a good cast, and you got to be ready, and like. To watch my mom, you know, set the hook and be like, "All right, you just did it," and it'd be like it's gorgeous. Yep, Yellowstone cutthroat it was pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Like, never forget it. Yep. So anyway, we're just happy to be a part of that, and uh, you know, it, through our partnership with Edrington, uh, they really encourage us to step up our game because Brad, Kate, and I had always donated, you know, on smaller scale stuff, um, and then Edrington came in and they're owned actually by a charitable trust. Mm-hmm. So every dollar of profit that they bring in is given away. Wow. And so we were... Uh, and are they a marketing partner? Like a... No, so Edrington owns McAllen Scotch. Okay. Uh, along with uh, Brugal Rum, uh, Glen Rothis, Highland Park, etc. And they invested in us a few years ago. And um, it, it was an honor to be chosen as their American whiskey horse, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, it's been fun. I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about big business yeah, <laughs> and how uh, it brings a level of sophistication that is really helpful in a lot of instances. Absolutely. And uh, I've learned about big business mm-hmm. and knowing that uh, I would never want to be a true part of it. I, I, could, I couldn't, I don't think I could work, you know, in that organization, it, it, any organization like that. They're great, but it's just tough. Are there thresholds that, like, declare, like, small batch distillery versus, you know, big batch, like... How much does Wyoming whiskey produce in a, in a year? Like, we're producing a lot more thanks to Edrington um, <laughs> because like they, you know, they have a tremendous commercial team and and marketing, you know, reach, and uh, as a result, you know, we're maxing out, clo- you know, at this point, you know, yeah. we have no extra. Yeah. And what we're bottling today was actually put in a barrel five plus years ago. Yeah. And uh, so it's. They're also challenging us to do much more stock modeling long term. Sure. How much are we laying down today? Because we expect to be selling X amount in five years. How much of that do we want to be holding for aged product? You know that it's going to be much older. Yeah. Um, you know, which at this point, any really old stuff that we have now is almost by accident. Um, you know, we went through all sorts of phases as a company. We had to sell bulk for a while because in the beginning, I was like, let's make as much as we can and let's get a bigger still and more fermenters and all that. And meanwhile, we're spent you're hemorrhaging cash, making, you know, a lot of whiskey every year. But the sale, it takes a long time for a brand to build. Mm-hmm. And that's the one thing a small company can't do is get national. So Edrington has done a fantastic job with that. And their, their teams are great. And, um, you know, I mean, I could answer, you know, specific numbers. But I could say that we've probably more than doubled in the last couple of years as a direct result of them and the pandemic because people drink bottles of booze during pandemics and not just a drink at the bar yeah yeah absolutely i can say my first uh wyoming whiskey was right when you guys first released and we were going to cut a christmas tree i feel like it was like the the, re- the release was like right around like that fall holiday time. december one yep. yeah and uh we were all heading up to to cliff creek and um 
I hope my buddy Brad popped out of his truck with two bottles of Wyoming whiskey because I think that's all that you would like allow at the at the release was like something like that. He's like, here we go. We had a great great time cutting Christmas trees. A lot of Charlie Brown trees that year. Yeah. Uh, you know, but but it was it's good to see the business growing. Yeah, it's been fun. I've learned a lot. John, what are we doing different on this one? Um, so I'm just changing up the colors. Uh, I'm doing kind of like a tan or a cream color on the back. Um, next clump here uh, is going to be like a sand uh, kind of tan color. Then we're going to finish off the head uh, in an olive coloration. This one can look like a rainbow trout. I put uh, a pearl flash in there, a uh, flash, flash blue, and then uh, some kind of like a shell pink. It's a very light pink. Uh, again, if you want it to look like a rainbow trout, that would be a good option. Um, Looks like my uh, teenage niece's hair color. There you go. It's totally appropriate. You know, <laughs> their, their choice. There you go. Yeah. But um, just kind of, again, mixing up colors here. I've tied some uh, for warm water species. If you know what a fire tiger pattern is, it's uh, like a chartreuse orange and black. Um, and I'll take a Sharpie and I'll bar it, which I might do on this one. I'll take a, a Sharpie and I'll kind of mark it up a little bit um, to add a little bit of... Um, what's where I'm looking for here just a little bit different uh, separation in colors uh, a little bit darker spots kind of gives you a little di different contrast and stuff like that so what is your most productive color scheme with this streamer for the snake um I white <laughs> just white <laughs> I think most streamers in general for me as well but uh in white but definitely this one uh in white's definitely definitely done good I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, that white has that been guy. the color. Yeah, especially in the last few years, it seems. Yeah, for as much as you can get out and streamer fish, you know. Um, so when do the trout become smart that white is no longer their ally? I feel like they're yeah. they've realized it on like circus peanuts and some other things. I think circus peanuts. <laughs> yeah, you got to mix it up if you're gonna fish a circus peanut. Um, I mean, I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. When they kind of get smart and wise to white. I don't know. Huh? The new black. That's the new black, That's yeah. Why orange is the new one? Traditionally, and I guess I never asked why or anything, but early season, uh, before runoff, uh, whites, light grays, mm -hmm. yeah, were always a go-to, uh, not only just for here, uh, also down the Pinedale area, uh, but... Uh, especially especially here and this color combo I would probably have kept this pretty much white and just done a little olive uh, yeah. for that early season um, was always traditionally uh, great for the snake and I never am I doing a white fish am I doing a yeah I don't know, yeah that color just worked mm -hmm. yeah this you thing says, this thing says like big brown trout on the green Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That uh, says like go for a long, long float and enjoy it because somebody's gonna come after that guy. Oh yeah. So one of the things that I always wondered is the short strike. Mm -hmm. You know, like I I've definitely been in a phase where I like the articulated bug. It's not just like tying a stinger into the back, you know, of it because I find that I will get the short strike periodically. But yeah. it's probably my fault and how I'm fishing the fly or something. But what are your thoughts on? I mean, uh, I think sometimes when you get those short strikes, those fish really don't want to, they're not, they're not committed to it. If they're kind of just nipping at it. I think they're trying to get it out of their area. They're not really trying to move it on down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's why, again, in a pattern like this, I really like, because if you get those short strikes, you can strip it and keep it right in front of their face. Uh, yeah. So it pisses them off even more. And they're like, okay, that short strike or that nip on his tail is not getting them out of here. Now I have to actually give them the, the business here and, and, and bite them hard so um, <laughs> the business I, so, I like it so that's that's my thought process on streamer fishing which again kind of why I'm digressing from fishing these big articulated heavy guys and trying to utilize my sinking line or the sink tip line to fish that fly I can keep it in a certain zone longer uh, all that kind of stuff I think uh, plays a bigger role with streamer fishing anyways if you want to be more um, effective streamer fisherman, not saying that I don't also have those exact fly patterns in my boxes, but usually when I go 
uh, somewhere whether it's totally new or someplace I've been before usually I'll grab stuff like this first and that's kind of the last resort where um, kind of getting desperate for for a fish to eat so it's just something a little different here where do you want to go that's someplace new Oof, I mean there's I a asked lot that, you know I asked places. this this question of like my uh, my board um, at our annual retreat um, a year ago I said you know like we we are fortunate we we think and, and love about like about rivers all over the place where do you want to go and uh, man I got some amazing responses from people that have had want to go incredible experiences on rivers locally and around the globe yeah I mean there's I don't know that's a very good question I don't have in locally wise I've never really spent that much time on the green mm -hmm. definitely would love to fish the green more yep um, oh get creative come on you're putting too much pressure on me um, I've never caught a bull trout. Keep tying your bug and it'll come to you. I really yeah. want to catch like a big bull trout at some point. Bull like, trout would be fun. I want um, to like hit like the South Fork of the Flathead or something and like a big pack trip. Yeah. Bull trout fishing. It would be. Uh, maybe you're not allowed to fish for bull trout there. I'm not sure. Yeah. We yeah. Can't tell. Yeah. yeah. They say you wouldn't go right, there. Dave, I want to go back to what you were saying with short strike. Kind of goes way back. Uh, we were talking. Same thing, we're getting short strikes, we're doing this, whatever. And uh, this old timer or whatever, we were up on the big hole, looked at me and said, uh, let me ask you this, how many times you miss your mouth with a fork? <laughs> so at that time, I fished for fly very, very similar to this, uh, Garside Maribou uh, streamer, very sparse was done on a short shank hook or whatever and to this day I mean that's that's still a go-to fly of mine uh, and you don't get short strikes I mean they eat it and it's a short shank hook yeah yep. so my thing that was always like why do we need an articulated with a stinger hook or whatever uh, I always found big flies whatever definitely will move fish mm -hmm. whatever but do they really commit, just what John said? I mean, if you're going for big, big fish, yes. Uh, but uh, most of us aren't going to be, you know, if you're fishing four days and you finally get one fish, mm -hmm. you know, there are certain people that, that do that. But most people, you know, they they're need a fish or two here and there. Uh, so a much smaller fly like this is going to still produce a good-sized fish, yeah. but it's going to catch smaller fish also um, but going back with what John say my theory always was if I'm getting a fish that's short striking consistently I'm moving fish seeing it come and follow whatever but not really taking there's something the matter with that fly either I'm fishing too big or or it's, there's something the matter it's 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 not committed because just like you said I mean if they want it they don't miss it yeah, yeah. I, I guess I've always wanted to tie that stinger in uh, just to help those uh, fish with commitment issues commit. <laughs> <laughs> just in case there's any question, let's make sure we got them. Yeah. But I hear you. That's a great point. And that's a great point. And I, and I have been fishing smaller streamers. I went through that huge. I'm not a great fly tire, but I've tied those bigger dungeon type bugs because yeah. they're easier to tie. They're, you can make mistakes on them. They don't show like this thing would show much more. Um, but now I'm getting into the smaller streamers and like seeing this bug this is a great education for me mm -hmm. but yeah uh that's just i have a lot more confidence fishing something like this where i can i can actually fish the fly i think that's another big thing too um when it comes to guys that like the streamer fish is and i'm very guilty of this too usually if i fish a streamer that's all about i have in the bow is my seven weight and eight weight done I'm also like I'll fish that for an hour and be like, oh, there's a five weight with a nymph rig right there. I haven't caught a fish in the last hour. Okay, I'm gonna start fishing that. Mm -hmm. But I think committing to fishing specifically a streamer also makes you a better streamer fisherman from the aspect of like you have to learn how to fish your fly. You just can't strip, strip, strip. It's not just a very repetitive motion. You gotta put the rod tip over here, twitch the rod tip, okay, this way, do it this way, now dump some line, so it dry, like, just a lot, you have to be able to Swim. adjust, yeah, you have to fish the fly, you yeah. can't just throw it out there and hope for the best, you have to. 
Well, yeah. one of the things that you were talking about, like keeping that right in front of their face. Yeah. So the Jimmy Jones, the JJ special, when that came up, and that was totally fish, totally different. I was fishing with guy guided up on the Bighorn forever, and after like three or four strips coming away, he's like, "Why do you keep doing that?" Uh, because you know, if there's fish there, he would have taken it by now. Just get back on out there. But well, we weren't doing that with the Jimmy Jones special, uh, uh, JJ special. Is you know, it had the rubber legs, whatever, and nobody was doing stuff that we were doing. We were casting it in, leaving it in there, and doing a twitch yeah. like this, where that fly is coming down along the bank, having those rubber legs go boom, 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 not coming away from the bank, because. As you go like yeah. that, you give it line instead of stripping it in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's coming along the bank, going boom, 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 like that. You know, eventually it gets towards the end, then it's coming away. But back in those days, nobody was fishing streamers. I, I like had a, a, an amazing experience this fall where I was out on the river with uh, Gene and Paul Brune, and uh, Paul basically said the same thing to me. He's like, Jared, he's like, you're, you're casting that thing great, you know, and stripping it well, but like, how about try this technique? And he's like, just basically put the rod tip to the water and let it bounce and pulse. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. He's like, all right, bounce, 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 set. And it was like, boom. And I'm like, come on. That was right. ridiculous. Magic. That was like beyond ridiculous. Um, and then like on the next cast, same thing. He, he coached me through it. And I was like, Okay, I've got a lot to learn. I've got a <laughs> lot to learn because for me, it would have been cast, float that same run of water, but tug, tug, tug. Yeah. And it was a total different style of fishing a streamer. And you know what? I wasn't catching fish before that moment. <laughs> and then I started catching fish and it was awesome. Totally. These, these guys kind of know what they're doing. I was like, <laughs> it, it, was, it was a very enlightening experience um, to, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just hit I hit this with a sharpie. Just put some barring on it. Um, you know, a lot of juvenile bait fish have barring in them. You know, if you've ever caught a small rainbow trout, pretty much this exact size, they'll have those dark par marks on them. Same thing with the white fish, which is why I didn't put barring on it, but I put that uh, barred flash or that voodoo fiber in there to imitate that. Um, just little little things like that, I think, can make a difference and, and uh, again give you a little more confidence. Uh, and fishing that and i think sometimes that might even be a key um for a fish to kind of look at and see like oh, okay maybe that is a little bit more something i want to eat and a little more realistic so um but yeah it's a dave's bad hair day anyways uh again two different colors of all white and this is again kind of a cream and tan with a little bit of olive uh, again i've done pretty much this exact one uh but i'll change the front out for like brown craft fur and then i'll put a brown laser dub head on there um, putting a little bit more like golds and coppers and stuff in there if you want to tie a juvenile brown trout. Um, Jared, which one are you taking? I was just saying. Uh, what, did you not hear the the conversation? White. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, well, maybe we'll end the evening on maybe a quick little fishing report. How are our rivers looking? And Jared, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about... We don't really have a lot of snow. Well, we have snow, but it hasn't snowed. And how is that affecting um, the snake in particular? Yeah. So as of today, the Upper Snake River Basin is at 95% um, of its historic snow water equivalent. Um, we haven't, we've had maybe, what, 10 inches of snow since, like, the first week of January. So uh, we got a little dusting last night, um, about three inches up in the high country and just kind of a trace down here in, in the valley floor. So I would say we all need to do our snow dance and um, sure. and hope for water in the high country and on the valley floor. Um, we need that snow down low, too. Um, and, you know, we're, we can't forget that last fall, Palisades Reservoir was drawn down to historic lows. Uh, Jackson Lake um, was drawn down to historic lows. So these these water bodies need to recharge, and so do the tributaries. And so I can't speak to the fishing because I haven't been fishing since um, right around uh, the first week of November, which was a great day on Jackson Lake. Um, but... Um, we need water and we need snow. Um, so let's yeah. keep our fingers crossed that we do have a heavy February. It's, uh, it's 
a little skinny right now. It happened last year. It happened in a last big year. way. Yeah. Well, yep. yep. So, and and I think it's important to recognize that um, our historic snowfall patterns may be shifting. Right. We may be seeing snow at different months and and different um, water quantities and. Uh, and just with like the snowfall, also our runoff is happening a little earlier. So yeah. like the whole system is, is changing and and we as individuals, whether it's we're out there fishing or just enjoying rivers, um, need to be aware of that. But like so do our water managers and, and users in this valley and on downstream through the system. We're, we're going to have yeah. to make some changes. Yeah, I would say so. Fishing wise, um, two, I haven't even fished this month. It's been so cold. <laughs> it's only um, one day in. Only one day. Oh, hold on. <laughs> for last month, sorry. Um, last month, yeah. I mean, I did fish. I think one day, and it didn't pan out on the on the upper snake here. But that's all right. I think if you if you want to get out and fish, you're definitely having to drive elsewhere. Um, South Fork and Henry's Fork. Um, even even beyond that, I'm sure if you really wanted to. But typical winter stuff, midges. You know, um, if you're going deeper, you know, nymphs, patch over legs, even midges, just small stuff light tip it i don't think anything changes from there when was uh when was the last time you went out ken sunday sunday how was it too cold too cold <laughs> too cold exactly i think it's okay to say that you don't fish right now i think that's all right it's well, it's yeah. ski season <laughs> it's january february coldest time of the year yeah we've had three weeks of like jared like you said we haven't had three weeks of really really cold weather no but we've had three weeks of consistently cold weather daytime yeah. temperatures not much reason uh, reaching 20 yeah um so you know until things start loosening up here a little bit uh for our valley it, it's gonna be a little bit i mean you can pick the day yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> the hour yeah well, <laughs> i mean it's yeah. winter fishing so typically you know it's gonna be 11 to 3 anyway yep. yeah uh, and 11 is gonna be extreme three probably gonna be extreme but uh yeah, so it's just the way it is. Um, you know, like you said, um, last year at this time, over on South Fork, Henry's Fork, yeah, it was it was going. Yeah. Um, you had a couple of days over, Ken, on the Henry's Fork. Henry's Fork, yeah, that was pretty decent, whatever. But again, it's been cold over there now too. Yeah. yeah. So until things start breaking up here, I mean, we're only a week or two. I mean, it's February. Yeah. Yeah. I can say like driving into the <laughs> shop tonight. At six o'clock, coming in from the West Bank, they're still light down south over Munger mm -hmm. and like North Fork of Fall Creek. Like that Alpen Glow was still happening at six o'clock, so the days are starting to yeah. to lengthen a little bit, and you can and and I feel like you can feel it a little bit too, even though the temperatures are cold. Yeah, for sure. But and hopefully this year, you know, traditionally February is a big big water month, a big snow month yep. for us. Yeah. Or hopefully it's that. Um, but year after year. I mean, push comes to shove, it's April. Yeah. April, early May. Um, is, you know, last year, March turned 50, 60 degrees. Yeah. And so we had early runoff. The uh, year before, uh, we were still buried. Yeah, we were still buried. So, yeah. So every year. So we'll have to see. But, uh, yeah. But come on, March, <coughs> come on, February. Bring it. Last year. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you guys. Right. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for yeah. inviting us. That was a great show. Appreciate you guys. Thank you for the cocktails, for the insight. John, great flies. They're going to fight thank over you. that white one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and for the great questions. Really good questions tonight. Um, this is posted, all of these are posted on our YouTube page, um, along with some other fun stuff. So check that out. And as always, pop on in the store, give Howard a run for his money, ask him some hard questions. Um, and we will see you March 1st, I think is the two, next Tuesday. I think we're going to do two back to back in March. So March 1st and March 8th. So that'll be a good show. I think we have Trout Unlimited coming and Travis and Chaz over from Stillworks. So another good show in the works. Um, so thank you again, guys. Have a great evening and um, free feel to ask any questions. Give us a call, you know, hit us up. We're here to help. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you.